Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We got two quick and interesting diaries from Didier today. First one is about retrieving malware over Tor. Tor, of course, is often used by attackers to anonymize themselves, but can also be useful for the defender. If you are analyzing malware, you often don't want to give away who it is actually who is analyzing the malware. Didier shows how to use Tor socks and curl in order to make this more anonymized download pretty easy. And in a second diary, DDA is talking about how to properly analyze SSL TLS with Wireshark if it's using an off port, for example, port 22. Port 22, of course, is commonly used by SSH, not SSL or TLS. So if someone happens to use TLS over port 22, which is certainly possible, you have to tell Wireshark to explicitly analyze it as TLS. And looks like all the confusion about the Meltdown Inspector patches are just not settling down. Intel now removed some of the microcode patches that it has released, in particular since a couple systems like Ubuntu, Red Hat, VMware, and also HP had issues with these updates. Now, initially it looked like only some of the older architectures were affected by this, uh, but it's also Broadwell and Skylake. Broadwell was released in 2014, I believe. Skylake followed it uh, sort of 2015, 2016. So these chips are still currently being sold and they're having problems with uh, these patches. Linus Torvald also got in the game here about the patches that Intel released and he has taken some objection here at the way Intel has patched that in part because for modern CPUs apparently there is a flag that you can set IBRS all that will essentially turn off the broken behavior and enable the correct behavior, but you specifically have to set that, which is uh, sort of interesting. So I doubt we have seen the last yet of Spectre and Meltdown patches. On a good side, however, there are now a number of benchmarks in from patched systems. And overall, it looks like for most systems, the performance won't be really going down all that dramatically. And China made an interesting advance in quantum cryptography. Now, for a while, China has a satellite in orbit that's able to establish encryption keys using quantum cryptography. Researchers in China and Austria now use the satellite to establish an encrypted video conference link where the key for the encryption was negotiated using quantum cryptography. And actually, probably somewhat more interesting is that this wasn't a just the satellite link that was encrypted here. It was actually sort of end-to-end -end encryption. It included a 280 kilometer ground connection from the Chinese research lab to the satellite transmitter. So this shows some actual real plausible and practical applications of quantum cryptography. Overall, the challenge has always been limited bandwidth. That's also why in this case, the quantum cryptography link is only used to exchange the key. The higher bandwidth part, the video conference part, just uses then that key to use traditional encryption algorithms in order to encrypt the connection. The key material here was exchanged at a rate in the kilohertz range, so probably the actual video link here. The bandwidth of the quantum crypto link here was in the kilohertz range. And I guess uh, this podcast these days isn't complete without something cryptocurrency related. Someone looked closer into Geth. I talked about Geth before. It's an Ethereum wallet that has a very unfortunate, unauthenticated JSON RPC API. Well, uh, of course, it's vulnerable to DNS rebinding. So even if you don't necessarily expose uh, this uh, RPC, 
feature to the outside world. Uh, well, you may still be vulnerable uh, because via DNS rebinding an attacker could trick your browser to send commands to this interface. And well, uh, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.